Now I'm going to show you a map by country, because it was the best that could be done at the time, uh, but a map by country of where GenBank sequences come from. And you'll see one thing right away about it. Okay, red is lots of sequences. You get it? Okay. Um, so you can see kind of the, the biotech leaders, US, Canada, uh, Europe, and China, India. Um, they're clearly the standouts. South Africa. But then you see the remainder of Africa um, essentially bringing up, bringing up the tail of the distribution. And Bolivia. I think that was no data, yes. if I remember. No yeah, I, I, don't, I don't remember. No, you know what that is? It's, it's very low. Because uh, the, the color ramp that we used was from charcoal to red. Uh, white is probably no data. White is in the middle. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, anyhow, that's, that gives you a view, and we'll come back to this. <laughs> but let's, you know, one thing is that you'd be at the lower end of the distribution. The question is, is there enough information? No. no. I don't know. You don't know. No, don't. Let's find out, okay? What we'll do as just a bit of an exercise after I finish talking is go to your country and see what, what sequence data there are from your country. I look, yes, yes. Hold him. I don't want you to pass without a, take uh, some minutes about the genetic identification, genetic taxonomy, uh -huh. all the activities related to genetic formation. Actually, I don't know you are in the advanced country, maybe you have some facilities. I tried more than five times to try to do the uh, molecular identification of my samples. Mm -hmm. I failed. What taxon? Uh, I was working on the ants. Okay. And uh, there, there was, was some, one species I want to see its molecular diversity and to determine if it is exotic or endemic, mm -hmm. then to determine mm -hmm. where it is coming from, if it is exotic. Now, the challenge is, in our, you have seen that in Africa, most of the countries don't have the data. Not because researchers do not have the will to do research in this area, but due mm -hmm. to the barriers which are there. Of course. For example, in Rwanda, it is very hard to do molecular Mm -hmm. analysis. Mm -hmm. Even for some diseases we used to go in India, in South, Africa. South Africa. Now we have a laboratory of molecular analysis, but it is the absolute results of medical services. Mm -hmm. For other tests it is sure, not sure. possible. Sure, sure. I had a, a colleague of mine in Belgium. That's it. Um, some of the challenges. I, and he has a very good laboratory in entomology at the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences. Then he told me, you see, my friend, somebody who used to work on this machine for medical identification is not allowed, so the identification is not possible. Mm -hmm. Now, to come at the end of this uh, challenge, I would, like, I would like to ask you if it's possible that in your laboratory, or in the laboratory of your colleagues, if now we have the partnership through this training, is it possible that uh, maybe if I send one sample, two samples, <laughs> is it possible that I do that? <laughs> <laughs> I see you are laughing at me, but no, I'm not are laughing. asking a question for the majority of no, us. No, no. I'm laughing with you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah because this is really the things that we need, yeah. especially when we're dealing with these uh, macroinvertebrates, the uh, vectors of different diseases, different sure. different sure, 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 sure. Sometimes we may even blame those animals that they are vectors of such kind of disease, which while it is not true, 
because sometimes are basing on predictions on, on what we have in my mind in our minds but we are not sure if really what you are talking is yeah. true yeah okay that's a lot to answer um, I'll get to the the object of laughter first <laughs> um, we do not have funding for kind of receiving samples and providing molecular services what we do is very very frequently we receive visitors who come in with their own research projects and we make every every effort to essentially make possible their research and so my lab I don't do as much at molecular things but my lab typically at any time has between kind of two and ten visitors from outside who have some situation like that you know I want to do this at home I can't you know, but they can find a, a scholarship or something to come and, and visit. Um, but I think it speaks to a larger problem. You know, certainly laboratory ca capability here is a challenge. But there's an even deeper problem. With your ants or with innumerable other taxonomic groups, you may get a nice perfect sequence and then you go to these databases and the, the process of looking for similarity or looking for similar sequences is called blasting. I'll show you that at the end of the talk. Um, but when you do a blast search, essentially what it says is, you gave me this sequence and here are the things that are most similar to it. If the base of information in the database is too thin, is very incomplete, then you will get a very wrong answer because it won't be the closest species to yours mm. it will be the closest species in the data set to yours and you can get really wrong answers yeah. I'll give you an example um, a friend of mine was working on um, kind of the, the, the deep phylogeny of birds and he had funding for I don't know 600, 700 taxa yeah. and so he was trying to get all of the major branches of bird diversity so that he could do a particular procedure. And he asked everybody around the world who has tissue collections of birds for this sample and this sample and this sample. And he came to the University of Kansas near the end because we work in places where nobody else wants to. Okay, and so we have collections from kind of the far corners of the earth, but also the far and, and inaccessible corners of the earth. And so I think they asked us for 50 or 54 samples, something like that. And one of our graduate students extracted the samples and, and packed them and sent them. And six months later, my friend called up and he said, you know, you guys, your tissue collection is a total mess. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, we, we did quick mitochondrial sequences of all of your, your samples, and we blasted them, and they all show up as like the wrong genus or the wrong family. And, you know, I'm fine. I know there are errors in our tissue collection, yeah. but it should be one or two out of 50, not, I think he said, you know, 40 out of 50. And I'm, you know, well, what had happened? Remember, they came to the University of Kansas and asked us mm. for some of the rarest and least known taxa. Mm. And so when they blasted their sequences, there were no reference sequences. Yeah. And so the next nearest thing was something that didn't make sense. Mm. And so that's, that's the interesting and kind of damning problem behind your question. Mm. Let's say, I mean, I would love to have funding to be able to receive samples and send you back sequences. Mm -hmm. But if the reference data set is incomplete, like the ants of, of Central and East Africa, mm -hmm. if that is terribly incomplete, those sequences won't mean anything for you. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that I have a good answer. Yeah, yeah it's just fine. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a whole different question of doing taxonomy by molecular data. 
Yeah. So and that, that's a, maybe a topic for another day. So from your explanation, it seems as we first of all have to get the references. And then after, when we do the molecular analysis, we have the reference to compare to, to come up with the... Right. So, for example, one of your neighbors, um, a colleague of Emmanuel's, um, Henry Njovu, has a JRS project that is partly about what I call primary occurrence data, but it's also partly about barcoding bees of that part of Tanzania. And when they finish, they will have, I don't know how many taxa, but they will have kind of basic diagnostic sequences that are easy and repeatable to sequence. Mm. And that will take care of, you know, kind of one end of the, the, the Hymenoptera problem. Not very useful to you. Yeah. But it takes a project like that where you say, I'm going to go out and collect every taxon of this larger taxon, of Hymenoptera or of, or of ants or whatever, and I'm going to take five of every species and I'm going to get just simple diagnostic sequences. It's a lot of work. Okay? Okay. Other questions? Okay. So I went to GenBank and I searched on Rwanda. Now, you'll see this if you go to GenBank. There are some things that GenBank does really, really well, like holding billions of sequence uh, data. But there are things that GenBank does really badly. And so I was looking for search by country. And guess what? You can't. They do locality information really, really badly. And so, in and amongst my, my Rwanda searches, I got this thing, it looks like it's a virus, and it's an isolate of this bunchy top virus from bananas. It's an isolate that's named Rwanda. Probably was collected here, but it wasn't like I was searching on a place, it just found that combination of, um, of letters. And so here's a list of the taxonomic groups along with numbers of sequences. And what you can see is, you know, uh, chordates 963, arthropods 131, a um, thousand bacteria. So just kind of scattered stuff. Let's look a little closer. Sorry, I'm a, I'm a zoologist and I work with big things like birds. So immediately I went to uh, the chordates and the vertebrates. And what I found was in mammals, 630 out of 674 sequence records in GenBank are for primates. And there are a bunch of other vertebrates, but the only one I care about is birds. 17, okay? So this is a pretty clear picture that you don't have enough to do much with, okay? And then you go into one of these records. So this is one that's from Rwanda. Um, you go into it and there's first a bunch of metadata fields and so there's kind of a title, Gorilla, Gorilla, Beringii, Mitochondrial D-loop DNA, uh, gives the taxonomic hierarchy, it gives a, uh, a citation, this is, this is a sequence that was associated with a publication, um, it has machine readable metadata, and then here's the sequence. This is a very short chunk of the mitochondrion, but other ones will have you know, thousands to millions of, of base pairs beyond that, okay? So I kind of want you to just get in and play when, we are, when we're done talking. Just get in and play and see what you find, okay? Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the analysis tools. So let's imagine 
uh, just like Venus State. Let's imagine we have a sample, and let's imagine he sends it, I guess, to University of Oxford because University of Kansas can't help him. And University of Oxford sends him back a, a sequence. Erin's ignoring me, but she's a geologist, so they don't do sequences, right? <laughs> uh, you get back your sequence, what do you do? It's just a bunch of letters. So essentially what, ha what is done in the processing of what's called blasting is you calculate alignment scores. So you use scoring matrices that allow, allow you to qual quantify the quality of sequence alignments. And you can see like here, on this sequence there's a T, and on this sequence there's an A. Okay? Or on this sequence there's a G, and on this sequence missing data, because sometimes um, base pairs or sets of base pairs just get removed from a sequence. Okay? And so essentially you sum up the, the matches and, and you take away the mismatches and you, you have to decide on a penalty for a gap like that. But there, there are formulas that then translate into this blasting. Um, and you also have to um, give a, a set of penalties for what kinds of changes should be harder or easier. So if you remember back to a genetics class, transitions versus transversions um, are easier or harder to occur given the, the molecular structure of the uh, nucleic acids. And so uh, essentially what, what gets done is you use a query sequence, you derive a list of words, which are just combinations of base pairs, of a particular length. They're calling it W. And here they're using the example of three. And so they, they essentially tag high-scoring words. So, you know, here you can see ABC matches that really well, BCD matches that really well, CDE and DEF. Okay? And so essentially they, they get scored with um, how well they match up to some part of the reference sequence. And then um, that gets compared against the entire database uh, using the, these, different, um, these different algorithms. The most common is, is BLAST. Uh, but essentially you, you BLAST something and you come out with a, a, a matching score. And if it's, you know, 99.9%, .9%, you're pretty happy with an identification. If it's 60%, you should be less happy. And so here's an example um, where we have this, looks like a protein sequence, not a DNA sequence. And here are a bunch of alignment scores, okay? And those translate into this table that you get out. So this is a, a blast search where they put in that sequence and they get out that the, the number one was a probable MASH2 protein from a rat. And then there's a, the second one was a MASH1 gene. I mean, this wasn't my example, or I would have picked something more exciting. Uh, but I'm just trying to get you to see that there are these different scores that are essentially how good the match was. Okay? And one thing you can see right away is here we have a huge gap between everything lower and this, and then those top five are very close to each other. And even then, the top one is well above numbers two, three, and four. So you'd want to look at that particularly, or those, okay? But always, given, given where you guys live, you would also always be thinking, how good is the representation for my region and my taxon? Because if the representation is very sparse, 
then your answer is going to be approximate. Okay, it's not going to be exact. So that's kind of a view, quick, dirty, and done by a non-specialist. Uh, that's a view of this one set of ecosystem, uh, essential biodiversity variables. Um, this is genetic composition. Maybe a little bleak for here. I'll show you something tomorrow, because Aaron won't let me talk anymore after this. Uh, I'll show you something tomorrow which will make you maybe a little bit happier. Okay? Monday. 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 <laughs> I'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Tom's going to talk to an empty room. <laughs> uh, no, Monday we will look at species populations. Mm -hmm. And at least for the, the kind of yes-no sort of populations, we can get to some really neat stuff. For the numbers kind of populations, right? So this, this is a little disappointing. And it'll be interesting. Let's, we have time to, to do a quick exercise, don't we? Let's ask you guys to go into one of these databases. Probably the best would be GenBank. And just look up your country. Just do a, a search for you know, your country and you know, look at the top hits. See if they're all, you know, some virus or something or something biomedical, or is there are there top hits that are that are more interesting to organismal biologists? Now this is a light duty exercise. On Monday, see I remembered. On Monday we're going to uh, talk about species populations, and I'm going to give you an exercise that is hard and that is fun, which is to say you will get a cool map out of it. And whoever does, I don't know if it's the fastest or the nicest job, there's even a prize. I believe none of the other instructors has offered a prize. Yeah, but I'm going to offer a prize. Uh, <laughs> My prize is going to be better than that. <laughs> so, um, Forgive me if this one was a little bleak. It was the shortest one I had, so I put it this afternoon because we don't have much time. Okay, we have six more, and they won't all be this bad. <laughs> Any questions about genetic composition as an essential biodiversity variable? If you remember back to the intro that I gave you to EBVs, one of the qualities that they had to have was feasibility. Mm -hmm. And what we're saying is that where we are right now, it doesn't look like genetic composition has been very feasible here in Africa. Mm -hmm. So it's something to think about. And, and what you will see over the next few days is that I have a pretty critical verging on very negative view of essential biodiversity variables because they're not global and they're not feasible. Two of them are, five of them aren't, four of them aren't. 